it is one of those one of my favorite times to get up and and preach and it's one of those passages today and messages that I just uh, get to really dig into because I'm so passionate about uh, generations and what it means to invest in the next generation and so our title day is changes because so often when there are generational divides and gaps and generations change uh, from one to the next there are so many changes we have to go through as a society as a group as a church but it's one of those things that as a as a church we get to really uh, grab hold of and make the most of. It's part of our DNA at Bridgewater to just make a safe space for kids and for students. And I get to serve alongside Pastor Katie, our kids pastor, who uh, the, if you, many of you dropped off your own children today, they're back here in the theater um, just having a blast. But it's one of those things that we just get to really invest in students, and it's one of my favorite things. Um, so we're going to talk about these generations and, and the, the advantages to fostering relationships with the next generation. Before we dive in, though, I want to um, I want to start by kind of labeling you all, which is very contradictory to what my message is. But I'm going to label each of you based on the year you were born in a generation. So we're going to have some fun. Um, so if you were born between 1927 and 1945, you are part of the silent generation. That's what you're that's what you're called. And member, members of this generation were known for this. They went through their formative years during an era of suffocating conformity. Love that. Some of you may not like that, but love that. But also during the post-war happiness, there was peace, jobs, suburbs, television, rock and roll, great cars. Uh, you were the Korean and Vietnam War generation. You lived through the civil rights movement. That's incredible. Women stayed home generally just to raise children. Uh, and if they did work, it was jobs like teacher, nurse, secretary, you valued loyalty to a corporation, meaning if you had a job, most of you in this generation stuck with that company because you were loyal to it until you retired. I got an amen over here. You value marriage for life. You value reading newspapers, which frankly, from my generation's standpoint, we don't get. You value swing music. You're disciplined, self-sacrificing, and cautious. That's the silent generation. Now, I will say this. In my research, depending on where you're digging around, in these uh, age groups, these, these years you're born, there are about three to four years gap that it might overflow from one to another, depending on where you're born in your family, if you're the youngest or the oldest with your siblings, that might contribute. So it may not be cookie cutter like, boom, we're labeling you, but for the most part, it, it's pretty solid. So next group, 1946 to 64, you are the baby boomers. I got a few cheers out there. I got some boomers in the house. So here's a few things to describe you. You are the me generation. The me generation. Rock and roll music. You ushered in free love and societal nonviolent protest. Thank you. You buy it now and you use credit. You were the first TV generation. And this is interesting. You're the first divorce generation where divorce was becoming more acceptable and tolerable in society. You're optimistic, driven, and team-oriented. Let's hear it for the boomers. Yeah. Next, 1965 to 1980, Gen X. <laughs> Sorry, you can have pride in your, your, your born. Gen Xers, you're entrepreneurial, very individualistic. Here's, this is a fun one. You feel misunderstood by other generations. You desire a chance to learn, explore, and make a contribution. This generation averages seven career changes in their lifetime. So they're not the silent generation where it's one and done. Seven career changes. School problems were about drugs. You, uh, you want what you want and you want it now but you're struggling to buy because many of you have debts you're cautious skeptical sorry skeptical unimpressed with authority self-reliance and you were raised in the transition phase from written based knowledge to digital knowledgeable archives okay all right i'm very proud of this one millennials 1981 to 2000 let me hear you if you're out there that's right that's right yes there are more of us uh, so millennials, there's some, there's some things that'll sting in here and some things to be proud of, but we've been nurtured by omnipresent parents, optimistic and focused. We do have some sort of respect for authority. 
Uh, there have been falling crime, rate, crime rates. Good, good work. We schedule everything. Uh, we feel enormous academic pressure. And let me tell you, as a millennial growing up in the 90s, that is true. Enormous academic pressure. Uh, we feel we have a generation and have great expectations for ourselves. We prefer digital literacy as we grew up in a digital environment. Let me tell you, as a kindergartner in 1995, I did activities on a computer. So from the moment I entered school, some of you are laughing about that. I'm getting serious right here, okay? I'm serious. In 1995, the, the first day I entered school, we were doing activities on computers. So let that sink in, okay? We prefer to work in teams. Uh, we like to have unlimited access to information and tend to be assertive with strong views. Uh, we've been told, oh, now you did this to me. You did this. We've been told over and over and over again that we're special and we expect to be treated that way. Come on, people. Millennials are special. <laughs> they do not live to work but they prefer a more relaxed work environment with a lot of hand-holding and accolades. Mm. All right. Now, you first four or five rows. This is you. We don't know much about you yet. We're still trying to figure you guys out. Okay? But from 2000 and on, your Generation Z, this is what we do know. You're tech-reliant, social media-driven. This is going to get heavy. Okay? When you've grown up in a world where all you've known is terrorism exists. Many of our Gen Zers were born either right before, during, or after the 9-11 terrorism attacks. The only life they've known is terrorism is in the news on a weekly basis. So I ask, as we experience these changes in our lives, these changes in our world, these changes in the generations of our church, how do we respond? And that was a heavy moment. We're going to come back to that, but I want us to have a little bit more fun. And we're going to play a little game where you'll see a couple of categories come up on the screen in a minute, and you decide where you fall. And I can tell you, I'll be answering for the millennials while I'm up here. But when you were growing up, where would you have gone to do research? Would you go to the library or the internet? Internet loud and proud, okay? What's a stinking library? We don't need books. Google is our friend. We Google everything, all right? Where do you, get to, uh, where do you go to look at pictures of friends and trod down memory lane? Do you open your yearbook or do you simply get on Facebook? Ah, <laughs> Polaroids, yeah. Okay, here's a good one. Where do you do most of your Christmas shopping? Department store or Amazon? Amazon Prime all day. Two-day delivery, bring it on. All right. How do you like to travel? Back roads or the interstate, highway, whatever you guys call that? I can tell you most millennials want to get where they're going fast. Sometimes my wife and I have discussion on can we take the back roads this trip. I'm an old soul sometimes, so. Uh, how do you pay your bills? Do you write checks or online automatic withdrawal? Let me tell you, my generation, what's a check? <laughs> I literally, and Gen Zers are worse. We had, a, we had a lesson. They might remember. We had a lesson down here. We were, uh, we were, one of our youth volunteers was there leading that, and we were talking about writing checks and balancing checkbooks. They're looking at me like, Pastor Tyler, this does nothing for us. We don't need this information. And I'm like, it's okay, because I was told I had to learn it, so we're going to teach it to you because you need to learn it. And they're like, it's all online now. I was like, I know, guys, I do that. I don't balance my checkbook. The Internet does it for me. Okay, it's all right there. So when I'm looking at writing checks, I'm like, I, I don't have checks. I just had to order some because I do keep a small supply and I ran out. But where are your pictures stored? Are they in photo albums at home or do you get on Instagram? Yeah. And then here's, a, here's the good one to wrap us up. How do you watch TV? Do you pay for cable or online streaming? Because millennials are freeloaders. Most of us log into our parents' Netflix account. Yeah. We're proud of that. We don't pay for no stinking cable. <laughs> Give us the internet. We're good. So generational divides, changes, all good stuff. 
And I can tell I've struck a chord with many of you because you, you get where we're at. You, you've grown up in your generation. You've been labeled. All of us have. Many of our generations even have nicknames to sum us up, to describe us. We've all been labeled. But I'll tell you this, church, God doesn't label generations. God calls generations. I want that to sink in. God doesn't label generations. God calls generations. There's not a single person in this room that doesn't have a role to play in the life cycle of the church, in the life cycle of our families and our communities, especially here at Bridgewater Church, to help raise up and pour into the next generation coming behind them. That applies to us all. So as we jump in, as we, as we look at some scripture today, as we talk about what's coming up and these changes that are going on in, in our lives, let that kind of resonate. We all have a part to play. Okay, so we're going to look at a guy, named, uh, guy today named John Mark. Now, just so you know, we, we don't have one uh, single scripture story or a book committed to John Mark. It's just we, we kind of get glimpses of him throughout the New Testament. So we're going to be bouncing around a little bit. But one of the biggest things John Mark experienced in his youthfulness was a problem with change. He had a problem with change. There was something in his story, something happened. We're going to read about it here in a moment. But something happened where he was not willing to adjust to life, to change, to make an effort. And so let's jump in here with Acts chapter 12. Like I said, we will bounce around some in the next little bit, but here's a snapshot. So when Barnabas and Saul, and Saul is also Paul, had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Okay, now notice who he's with. Two juggernauts of the New Testament, Barnabas and Paul. Chapter 13 when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. John Mark, that's who we're talking about. And we skip ahead. They've all returned home. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns we preach the word. Back to those places we mentioned before. Let's go back there. And Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him. And this is why. Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia, and had not continued with them in the work. John Mark deserted them. He was a quitter. He was a failure. He left. And right there we see that Paul, who's an older man doing the work of the Lord, labeled him as a quitter. But again, our God does not label generations. He calls them. There's more to come in this story. Anyone like change? Just love change? Yeah, that's good, because I don't think, it's, a, it's the human condition to try to find normalcy. We all go throughout our lives trying to fit things in our house to be the perfect spots or the perfect furniture. I can tell you, my wife and I, we're working on, you know, getting, getting our house like we want it, okay? We're always, you know, looking for another good deal, looking for a piece of furniture. We just sold a bunch of junk in a yard sale this weekend. Like, what's normal about that? You already have stuff. Why are you trying to stock it with more? And what's even more than that, we, we do have a baby coming this fall, our first, and that's going to bring, oh, thank you, thank you, that's going to bring even a whole new slew of what's normal for us. Life is constantly changing. And as human beings, we hate change. It is hard. And that's the problem of change. Oftentimes, we're not willing to go through the transformational process of change. We want to give it up and just Dig in where we are, dig our heels in and be done. This is good. This is normal. This is fine. Many of you can relate to this. Some of you might know this little analogy, but do you know how a caterpillar turns into a butterfly? It's a very important process, okay? They go, they wrap themselves in the cocoon, and if you walk past or see in your garden this cocoon trying to hatch and go over to help the butterfly, even a little pinprick in the cocoon to help it dig its way out, you have probably just killed the butterfly. Because part of the struggle of the change, of the transformation, the struggle of emerging from that cocoon is what gives the butterfly its strength to survive. That's a, that's a testament and a story and a uh, you know, radar for all of our lives. Anytime there is change and it is tough, it's the struggle, it's the journey that helps us come across on the other side, surviving and even thriving in our lives. This is going to be the story of John Mark. We're going to see how God used change to help him transform. 
I can tell you, if all those times I was young and I had people in my lives who were looking at me and realizing that I, I, I could be something and investing in me, if they weren't there, I wouldn't be where I am today. If I didn't have relationships in my life pouring into me, I wouldn't be where I am today. If there's one thing that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt about millennials and Gen Zers and probably every single person in this room, we value the investment of relationships. It's not this, this online Facebook stuff that means anything. It's the intentional regard of someone walking into your life, walking beside you, pouring into you, loving you, and helping you launch off their shoulders for even greater things. It was great. My wife and I, we got to go home this week to Tennessee, and uh, my parents went through us a, a baby shower, so we had a lot of uh, family and friends come over from, from church and whatnot where I grew up. I got to see Miss Mildred. Miss Mildred is just an amazing uh, woman in my life, and she actually was my Sunday school teacher when I was in fifth and sixth grade. And before, before we um, said goodbye, she came over to give me a hug, and I said, Miss Mildred, I was just thinking about you the other day. Can I, can I share something with you? She was like, yeah, sure. I was like, I want you to know one of the most special memories in my life is when you came and took me on a date to see Monsters, Inc., He's kind of looking at me like, what? I'm like, oh, yeah, don't you remember? You came, you picked me up. We went for a car ride. We got to the movie theater. You bought my tickets. You bought my Coke. You bought my popcorn. I got to pick out where we sat. We watched the movie. You drove me home. Now, in and of itself, the car ride from my home where I grew up into town for the movies was like an hour, okay? So, like, it was, we had plenty of time to talk without needing to talk during the movie. And so I just, like, that was just one of the most special moments in my life. No agenda. Just there. Just proving to me that I'm worth a date. Showing me that I'm worth the money for a movie ticket and a popcorn and a Coke. And we had a blast. And, you know, tears were welling up in her eyes. And she said, Tyler, that's one of my most special and fondest memories of you as well. See, Miss Mildred, the legacy that she has, she was my dad's volunteer youth pastor. And she loved the next generation so much. Okay, she works in the business world. She's not a teacher. She's not this. She's not that. But she invests and loves the next generation so much that she values them and pours into their life. I can tell you, I'm looking around this room. I see some of my volunteers in our youth ministry and some of you who I know volunteer in our kids' ministry. You are valuable. <laughs> Pastors love you so much. Not to say that the rest of you don't count. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that to value and put effort and energy into pouring into the next generation, that takes guts. Did you know this uh, youth ministry stat right here? The question most middle schoolers ask their youth volunteer, their youth pastor, is do you like me? Most of you high schoolers, whether you know it or not, you're asking the question, do I like you? Yeah. And so to walk into a teenager's life or millennial's life and say, I want to invest in you and prove to you and show you that you're worth something, it takes guts. And that's the kind of thing that this world needs. If it weren't for people like Miss Mildred in my life, or Miss Kim in my life, or Josh Weger, or Andy Stevenson, or Mark Shaner, if it weren't for all these people in my life who proved to me and showed me time and time again that I'm worth the investment, I wouldn't be here. They looked at me and they saw potential. They saw potential. And that's exactly what Barnabas sees in John Mark. There's a problem. John Mark's struggling with something. We don't know why, but he abandons the mission. He runs away. He flees from it. But Barnabas says, let's bring him back. In 15, we see that. He sees potential in John Mark. So I want to look at what happens there in that next, that next segment in, in verse 39. Yeah, verse 39 and 40. Barnabas and Paul, they had that disagreement, they had that argument, they, they parted company, and Barnabas took John Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Remember, these, this, this was the dream team, Paul and Barnabas. You have this man who's been anointed by God and Paul, he's gone through this powerful transformation, he's going around breathing life into churches and planting churches all around the region in the New Testament. Then you have the, the encourager, Barnabas is right alongside him, empowering these people to lead in their communities the dream team, and because of their outlook on one human being, they split. Barnabas saw potential. Paul had written him off and said, no, 
he's not worth it. See, Paul didn't think Barnabas was worth being in charge of the next church. He didn't see him on the list of the next Christian leaders conference. It wasn't worth it to him. I can tell you as a youth pastor, I get to hear the heartbreaking stories of the next generation and of these teenagers when they, when they share with their stories with me that dad walked out on them at a young age. That they don't know if they even have a place to stay when they go home. I hear these heartbreaking stories of bullying in school and drama and this, this game they play where they're comparing themselves to others. Yes, I'm talking about you. God doesn't see someone that needs to be compared. God's calling you. You're not labeled. That's the power that we get to have when we, when we pour into these teenagers. We see the stress. We see just how self-involved they can get sometimes. And if we're being honest, <laughs> each and every generation in a, in a youthful age went through this. Isn't it funny how every single generation before the one that came after said there's something wrong with it? Think about it. It was drug, sex, and rock and roll. And many of you are sitting in this room today, and you're fine, right? You made it. <laughs> Some of you maybe not, <laughs> but you made it. Each time there's a new generation, there's something wrong with them. They're just doing, doing life differently. And we've got to make the adjustment to pour into them, which is exactly what Barnabas wanted to do when he saw potential. I learned something new this week. Many of you who are teachers, science teachers, you might have already known this, but the definition of potential energy, to just kind of sum it up, is an object can store energy in a position. For instance, anybody got a pen with them today? Writing, taking notes and pens? Hold them up if you got a pen. Yeah, any, any pen clickers? Oh, yeah. Fidget spinners? This was my fidget spinner when I was in school, just so you know. Okay? Yeah, so when you, when you push down on that pen and that spring inside is about to pop out uh, for the ink, that's potential energy. It's not much. But it's a spring and you're holding in that potential energy. You let go, you release, the pen pops out. Maybe, maybe a better example is this. Anybody, bow and arrow, ever shoot a bow and arrow or anything? Okay, got a couple hands. That's great. Just so you know, I am a champion of bow and arrow. All right? In junior camp... I went to Camp Overton in Tennessee, and I won three years in a row, first place. And it's so great because I'm a saver. Anybody else love to save stuff? Nobody. I'm it. Nobody. Nobody. Okay, great. Well, then you, you can make fun of me with my wife in this. So we were digging through this, this, this junk in our house, and she's like, what is this box? I'm like, no, we're not getting into that box. That's an important box. What's in here, Tyler? I, just important things, Okay. So I open it up, and there's all these awards, all these accolades, all these trophies and things that I grew up a- achieving and getting. I just, just a simple piece of paper with my name on it saying I was champion, like third year in a row, Camp Overton Archery. I'm like, I'm keeping this. She's like, no, we're not. And I'm like, she's like, you never talk about this. Well, let it go on record. I've talked about it today. Okay? <laughs> talked about it today in front of all you witnesses. Yeah. I was like, I'm keeping this. I'm going to brag to my future kids that I can beat them in archery. It's like, no, you won't. So anyway, when you pull back that bow, and it's pulled back as far as you can physically pull it, that's potential energy. When that arrow is notched in, and you pull it back as far as you can go, and you launch it, it reaches its target. That's this group that's up here. That's many of the teenagers around this room. That's the theater full of kids back here. So much potential energy. And church, I'm calling you out. So many of you do it so well. You invest in your life groups. You invest in so many people around you that are the same age as you. But I'm challenging you. Who are you pouring into who's younger than you? And who are you allowing to pour into you who's older than you? Because we need each other. We're in this thing together. This next generation is one that has such huge potential. And unfortunately, they get a bad rap. I'm talking about my own. Okay, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago. I got to hear Dave Ramsey speak, and he was asked this question. Dave, what do you do with millennials? He didn't really understand that question. What do you mean, what do I do with millennials? See, Dave Ramsey, if you know who he is, he's built this company into this 600-man machine that just 
is doing a bang-up job. They really are. And they say, what do you do when you hire them when they're unmotivated to work? He said, those, those millennials don't make it into my, my place of work. This is, this is what I gathered from him, and I think it's true for my generation. Millennials have no middle ground. Uh, this, is, this is Dave Ramsey speaking. They are either bums in the workplace, and they drain the energy from the environment, or they are completely sold out, and they work harder than anyone else there. And I would venture to say, if the millennials who are working the hardest are there, they're because someone older than them poured into them and taught them those values. Generation Z, listen. Many of your, your parents and families and grandparents, your pastor, your volunteers are in this room. We believe in each of you. We pour into you. We've lived life. You have great potential. Don't let it go to waste. There are so many things, so many positive things we can be telling and teaching the next generation so that when they do reach adulthood, they're ready. John Mark, that happened to him because, you see, Barnabas chose John Mark, and we get to see what happens in this next passage. It's the power of change, the power of change in John Mark's life. See, he must have done something pretty incredible because in 2 Timothy 4, 11, this is what Paul says, only Luke is with me. Get John Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I read that and I'm like, seriously? So this is the same Paul who wrote him off as a failure, who chalked him up as someone who was a quitter and would do no good. And now he's calling upon John Mark because he does good work in the ministry. Thank you, Barnabas, for your investment in the next generation. See, if you're like me and you had to do some digging this week and maybe some mentoring from Pastor Drew to realize John Mark was actually the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He wrote, scholars actually think he wrote the first account of Jesus' life, that Mark was written before Matthew and Luke and John. And if you really do think about digging even deeper, only two of the four Gospels in our New Testament are written by disciples. That's Matthew and John. Mark and Luke weren't even in Jesus' core 12, and Mark wrote the first account. So to say that Barnabas, that his investment made a difference, yeah, it did. Because that account set the stage for the rest of the Gospels being built. The other writers referenced Mark when they wrote, and it set the stage for the impact of so many lives throughout the different centuries leading up to where we are today. That's the power of change. I believe in investing in the next generation. If you can't tell already, then I clearly haven't been very clear with that. It's so valuable. It's been valuable to me and my story. And we had a 100-year celebration a few weeks ago. And if, just unless you missed it, there's a banner that says we're 100 here now. And at that celebration, Esther Cottrell, our state administrator, stood up and handed us a plaque celebrating 100 years. And she ended by saying this, do it again. I can tell you, sitting in the front row, listening to her share, I was blown away by that statement. Do it again. Another hundred. And I began to ask, what difference do I make in that hundred? And it makes all the difference in the world. Church, you're gathered here today for a reason, for such a time as this. We've got to rely on each other to make the change we want to see I believe to do another hundred years, we've got to unite. We've got to trust each other and rely on each other and make the impact where it counts. <laughs> so often churches can get clickish, and you run around in circles that people are just like you, and that's great. I love doing life with my life group of younger uh, adults. It's fantastic, but I realize if I can't rely on people who are older and wiser than me, and if I'm not investing in the next generation, what impact am I really making? What impact is being had on me? And so out of that thought, that process, it was, it's a God thing. We had a speaker here, his name was Michael Thigpen, and he shared a prophetic word to our pastor. And so we're going to show you that clip here in a moment where you get to hear uh, his heartbeat for Pastor Drew and what I think is going to be the heartbeat for Bridgewater Church um, as we think about how we make an impact in the next generation. So please watch the screen. As I was praying and thinking about this time and whatnot, the other thing that the Lord just dropped in my spirit for you is that to keep the three, there are three men that you need in your life. 
There's one who's older who's pouring down into you. There's one who's your brother who's right there in the same place you are in ministry. And there's a younger man who you're pouring into. Those three, you have to keep those three. And if one should shift out, one goes on to be with the Lord, you have to find another one. If God sends another one away, you have to find another. But you have to keep three strong men around you at all times. Keep the three. That was his word for Pastor Drew. As I invite another fellow pastor of mine up, would you please welcome Pastor Aaron to the stage? He's the guy that keeps Sunday mornings working, really. So, yeah, I said you're the guy that keeps Sunday mornings working. <laughs> um, so Pastor Aaron and I, of course, we do serve along the same staff, but one of the, one of the main reasons that what, what Michael Thigpen said that really impacts me is when I first got here, I wasn't married yet, I moved away from home, my first ministry assignment, and um, I just started kind of having those second guesses, like, did I make the right decision? And I can tell you, after uh, being a part of the staff is amazing, and after different staff meetings, and even, even today, after different staff meetings that we go through, discussions that we have, I walk away knowing someone has made an investment in me. And the message that I've heard over and over again that I still hear is, Tyler, we want you to succeed. That's mentoring. That's an investment being made. And so I get to serve alongside Aaron, and um, being the, the youngest of a, a five staff member family is um, it's pretty daunting at times, um, but it's so exciting uh, to learn and to grow and even to lead up, which does happen a time or two. I have some good ideas, you know. Um, but it really is just a fantastic journey that I've been on. And so Aaron, when, when, when Michael was here sharing, um, and he shared those three insights for us about keep the three um what did that mean for us as a staff what did that mean for you personally yeah let me just clarify real quick while tyler is the youngest on our staff you do realize that the rest of the staff are still in their 20s correct so <clears throat> he's just the youngest 20 year old is all that is so um i just want to clarify that um thanks for clearing that yeah, up yeah 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 um that was a um that was a powerful moment for those of you that were here when Michael said those words. That was a powerful moment. And for those of you that didn't get to be here, you just saw the impact of that. And when he said that and we were processing things as a staff after uh, the 100-year celebration, um, you know, we kept saying, hey, man, what did you think? What did you think? What was your best part? What was your best part? And all of us unanimously, not talking to one another, said, you know, it was Michael's word that he said. And so, so we've had, you know, two weeks or so to kind of um, digest those words. And then Tyler uh, grabs me this week and says, you know, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're doing, the whole John, Mark, and Paul, and Barnabas. I'm thinking, oh, great. I hate that scripture. But anyways. Um, and then he says, hey, I want to use that clip from Michael Thigpen. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I just have been really struggling with this in my own personal life. And um, he said, yeah, it's the one where he talks about keep the three. And I went, yeah, I know which one it is. So I had to edit that video that we took of that. And, and of course, editing that video and matching up those 29 seconds out of a two-and-a-half-hour service and then getting the audio and video right, I saw that thing about 27 times. And I'm thinking, you know, God, why, why am I having to keep listening to this over and over and over? And then Tyler says, I want that clip. And then I'm thinking, gosh, what are you trying to say, God? And um, I'm preaching, and I'm sorry. All of those things, that's something that God's personally been dealing with me for several months. So Michael comes here, and he says it. Then Tyler says he needs that. Then he gets up there and preaches on John, Mark, and Paul, and Barnabas. I'm thinking, God, I hear you. Um, so one of the things that I am still grappling with, and even in the Ferry household as well, we are grappling with, we're, we're trying to, um, all four of us, um, not because Katie and I, uh, my wife is a children's pastor here on staff as well, but not because we're pastors, because that's what God's called us to do. And so we're trying to, to tell our children as well, all four of us are saying, who are we being poured into by? Do we have someone that's pouring into us? Who are we? Um, in ministry with, and not necessarily because we're on staff, but who are you doing ministry life with that's your same, about your same age? And then who are you pouring into that's underneath you? And yes, I will tell you, we are challenging our 17-year-old son and our 14-year-old daughter of who are you all allowing to pour into, who are you sharing with, and who are you investing in? And so I was processing all that, and, and I, I heard all those things, and I was so appreciative of what Tyler was saying, what Michael said, and then what we're talking about. And then God, God goes, well, Aaron, what that applies to you too. To which I said, yeah, I understand that, God. But you've given me a couple of names, and I just don't like the names that you've given to me. To which, to which he said it wasn't an option. 
Well, I didn't ask you for your input. I said this is what you're going to do. So all that to say, um, some of you may think that because of your physical age that there's nobody that's going to be able to pour into me. I, I would struggle a little bit with that comment, but so find somebody that's going to be able to really pour into you. Pour into who is someone that is relative to your age, like Tyler and myself. Um, in our 20s. In our 20s. Who, who are you doing life with? Who are you doing life with? Now, for some of you that are in the, um, the youth group that may be a peer or something like that, this is the biggest kicker for some of our young people. Who are you going to pour into now? Well, my daughter makes the comment, I'm only 14, and you have lived an incredible life, so who are you going to pour into? There are a gajillion, that's a huge number, of under 14ers under in that theater right there next to you. And that, that, would be, that would be, you know, some of you all, if you're wondering who that is. For all of you that are above 14, who are you pouring into? For all of you that are looking for that person that's pouring into you, they're out there. They're out there. Find them. Lock arms. I love what Michael says. If one is, if one is, rep- is, is gone, replace him. So, oh, I did my, I kept the three for a little while, and now it's gone. No, 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 no. Always, always, always keep the three. Always keep the three. I didn't mean to hog up your sermon time, but um, there you go. It's okay. Thank you for sharing. Would you, would you please celebrate uh, Pastor Aaron and the word that he shared? So each of you in, in your bulletins as you came in, you got um, a little chart that has three names or three blanks for names, and beside it we put the three spiritual musketeers. And for fun, you're going to get a three musketeers bar on the way out today. Um, but we did this to, to tie in the fact that each of us, each and every person in this room, has three names of people they can, they can think, of, think on and write them down. I can tell you, I'm, I'm a part of an organization called Lead 222. And it's a network and, and a coaching ministry for youth pastors. And I, I'm on a conference call twice a month with youth pastors who just need investment. And so I pour into them, I challenge them, I do these things. And, and it's awesome because when I was their age, first starting in ministry and I was a part of this organization, we have this constellation of someone who's older pouring into you, uh, someone who's uh, same age, same walk of life, a peer-to-peer relationship who's pouring into you, and then people who are younger that you're pouring into. And I can be honest with you. There were times in my life uh, in ministry where I looked at that list, and I didn't know who was filling those spots. I didn't know whose name was there, but I committed myself to praying and reflecting and asking for some advice and insights from others, and they helped guide me into relationship with people who are pouring into me, people who I can do life with on a peer-to-peer level, and people who I am pouring into. So I think, I think these three, keeping the three, that is so important for all of us in this place today. So again, just to reiterate, who is older that you're allowing to pour into you who are you doing life with? Who, and this is not, and I'll say this, spouses don't count for that. I tried to write Jen's name in, and I was told by a mentor like that. She doesn't count. Like, but I'm doing life with her. No, you, you, there, there's a ring on your finger. That, that is what you're doing. This is an extra relationship outside of the, of the family. And so you had to be challenged. Who's peer-to-peer? Who am I doing life with? And who's younger? And I can tell you, I can promise you, in the four years I've been a part of this organization, that list has changed probably three and a half times. Because life happens, transition happens, people move on to different roles, people move out of your life, others move in. But it's what Thigpen said, who, or who will you replace on that list if they move on? So as I'm kind of rambling here, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. And I want to read and kind of just share with you another scripture. And as I'm reading, let these words wash over you, but also reflect for a moment. And if you have those names that you want to write down on your card, start jotting them down. You can do that now. If you know, I meet this person for coffee every Wednesday and we do life together, great, put, put that person down. Or this person's a mentor of mine in the workplace. They challenge me. They help me grow. If you write them down. I, I'll describe it this way. I've told some of my youth this before. Um, an older mentor isn't someone who's supposed to be nice to you. Okay? They're going to kick you in the pants. All right? They're literally going to look at you and say, Knock it off, cut it out, quit doing what you're doing, let's move on. Because most of the time, and many of you, you can raise your hand at this, if you're, you're, you're busy, we're busy people. 
And if you're seeking after someone saying, will you mentor me, will you pour into me, they've got a busy schedule. And if you're not doing what, what you and this mentor are agreed to do, they're going to say, why are we doing this? It's a waste of time. I can tell you, I've been kicked in the pants plenty of times by mentors of mine. They're not supposed to be, my, be nice to you. Your peer-to-peer, those encouragers you need in your life, same age, they're, they're your nice people. You can walk in and say, well, my mentor, you know, they told me you got to stop doing this, get off Netflix. Okay, let them love you up. That's their job. Let them hug you and and watch Netflix with you and do that kind of thing, okay? And then the younger person. This is someone that you're challenging, someone that you see so much potential in and you want them to grow, okay? That's kind of how you break it down. But let me me read this for you. Please, don't wait on me to fill out your list. Um, And if you don't know, commit to praying for someone to fill that spot, and God will show up. From Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, and here's what it says. Two are better than one. Because, if they have a good re- because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Church, I I honestly believe by committing to ourselves and to God that we want to surround ourselves with a family and a community who just values investment, who values relationships. This church body will not be easily broken. There's a world who is hurting out there looking for a place to come where they know they'll be supported, they'll have hope, they'll have love, and they'll be safe. Bridgewater Church is that place. And you know because you hear it every week. People what? People matter most. I tell, I tell your kids and your grandkids every week, you matter to us. 